Welcome back to our coverage of the Republican convention. I'm joined now by Carl Rove, uh, who's at the convention in, in Tampa. Two very different speeches last night, Carl. Uh, you had Chris Christie and you had Ann Romney. You think either one of them changed any minds on this? Oh, sure. Look, uh, there's not going to be a, uh, you know, a, a moment on the road to Damascus uh, at any time during this campaign. But people are going to make their decisions by collecting information and, uh, and at some point then making up their minds. And last night, both Chris Christie and Ann Romney helped in the process of building the narrative of this convention. Christie's was, look, I did tough things in New Jersey and the people of my state stood with me. Now we need to do tough things in America. And Mitt Romney is a man who will do them and the people of America will stand with him. And Ann Romney gave you know some personal insights into her relationship with her husband, and as a result, gave insights into the kind of person that he is. And then she also did, I thought, a, a wonderful and incredibly subtle, but nonetheless highly effective job of you know dealing with the issues of the so-called war on women by saying, you know, women are are having to deal with uh, you know going to the grocery store, making the health care decisions. They know how bad this economy is. They're the caregivers. They're the people who you know are filling up the family car at the at the gas station, and they know how. Uh, you know, tough life is and how we can do better. Uh, uh, Carl, let's talk about each of those. Chris Christie first. Um, uh, you said he talked about how he made tough decisions in New Jersey. I've heard from some people who were watching that speech uh, last night who felt like he talked too much about what he did and not enough about Mitt Romney. Yeah. Well, you know, I've been through this convention planning process in 2000 and 2004, and there's always a tendency by the speakers to feel like they need to say more about the candidate than you might otherwise want to have. I think if he had made most of his speech about Mitt Romney, it would have detracted from Mitt Romney. He needed to build the case for why we need someone like Mitt Romney, and that is that the country faces tough decisions, and, uh, and, and, and these tough decisions can be uh, made effective. You can do these things and come out the other side, and then now we need that in Washington. I thought it was highly effective. Look, and, and, this, this, the people who are disappointed in it were the people who are already enthusiastically about, uh, enthusiastically pro Romney and wanted him to say more pro Romney things. That's right. Joe Trippi, my my Fox colleague, made an excellent point. This speech was aimed at the people in the. Uh, on the television set, not the people in the hall. And uh, that was the right point. place that's, to aim That's it. very interesting. And, and as far as Ann Romney, uh, the polls show something like a 10% deficit among women that Mitt Romney is facing right now. A uh, lot of women on the stage yesterday. Do, do you see any sign that that big gap between Romney and Obama among women is starting to erode? Well, we'll see. Uh, you know, you, again, you don't, one night worth of speeches doesn't solve a problem. It takes a concerted effort over a long period of time. I will say this: we, we focus a lot on women, and we should. We should also step back and take a lot of take a broader picture. First of all, President Obama is underperforming among women compared to where he was four years ago. In fact, that's why next week they're going to load up with a lot of women, not because they intend to extend their majority among women. It's because they're worried about having it diminished. The second thing is, is that we have, we do have two gender gaps here. We have a gender cap, gap among women for, for uh, Mitt Romney. We have a bigger gender gap among men for Barack Obama. He's made it, Obama's made a decision that is easier for him to try and hold on to his lead among women than it is for him to try and erase his lead among men. And, and frankly, the race is, as you saw, uh, yeah. you know, basically dead even. And that means that the gap among men is bigger uh, for Obama than the gap among women is for Obama. Uh, dead even or maybe leaning a little bit towards Obama right now if you look at the average of the polls. But obviously very, very, very close. Uh, very important tonight how Paul Ryan does big introduction on a national you know, stage. With, with all due respect, Alan, Alan, uh, yeah. Go ahead. You want to quibble? I, I'm yeah, not going to argue with, with you respect, over polls. You can't have Romney. You can't. Yeah. 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 Look. Look. Women are, are, there are more women voters than there are men. So if you're telling me that, that Obama's leading by 10 points among women on average and, and leading among, uh, among men by a couple of points, then he ought to be leading among everybody by eight or nine or 10 points. And he's not. That's just not the reality. The reality yeah, is no, the gap he's, he's, among men is the, larger than the gap among, yeah, that's right. The, the national, the, the, you know, we've, we've got Gallup 46, 47, 46. We've got ABC, Washington Post. I mean, all close. these polls are showing this to be a very close race. And you can't have a close race. You can't have a close race if if Obama's winning big among women and ahead among men. That fair, means fair point. unless there's another you know gender out there of which I'm not aware that we're polling. <laughs> yeah. No. Right. 
Uh, okay, let's talk about Paul Ryan and what he has to do. Big night for Paul Ryan. What 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 is his challenge? Well, it, in a way, it's almost bigger than Mitt Romney's because we at least know something about Mitt Romney. This is one where Paul Ryan is going to be introduced to the country. We've heard, we've read about him a little bit. We've heard about it a little bit. But this is going to be more people are going to watch him tonight than in any other event except the vice presidential debate. And so they're going to hear a lot about him and they're going to see him and they're going to take the measure of him. And so far, the evidence is that Romney did a good thing for himself by picking Paul Ryan. They've got a lot of press, a lot of ink. They've had a they've had a highly contentious debate over Medicare that at worst has been fought to a draw. And uh, Paul Ryan tonight will be able to stand up and communicate who he is and what he's all about. And look, he's got a great life story. You know, it's does, uh, does he talk uh, you about know, Medicare? Um, what should you know, he talk uh, about uh, Medicare? Uh, what should uh, he say about class. Medicare? Well, I, look, I, I think he ought to talk about, step back and talk about the bigger issue of we have these big social safety nets that are in need of repair and it is incumbent, they're, they're in danger of going broke and this president has failed to act and this team will act. And, uh, you know, there's got to be a mix because you got you want to have as many of these notes struck in the presidential candidate speech tomorrow night. So there's probably some debate back and forth behind the scenes as should we put this in Paul's speech or should this be in uh, uh, should this be in Romney's speech? And I don't know exactly how that's going to resolve itself. But this idea of reform conservatism, we have a responsibility to fix the, uh, the to put in place the the, the policies necessary to to, to uh, put our finances in good shape is going to be a big element, I think, of Paul's speech tonight. All right, Carl, let's talk about how Romney uh, can win this thing. Uh, you laid out this 3-2-1 plan a few months ago, saying he had to uh, take some states away that Obama won last time, and the three that you pointed to were uh, North Carolina, Indiana, Virginia. Virginia is the one there that looks the toughest for him right now, right? Yeah. Well, look, first of all, uh, let's be clear. If you're the Republican, you have to win states that Barack Obama won. That's nothing right. new. I mean, you can't win by simply winning the states that John McCain won, even though the Electoral College is 12 Electoral College votes closer if you just win those states because we reapportioned between 2008 and 2012, and states like Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, and Illinois lost Electoral College votes, and states like Utah, Texas, Arizona, Georgia, and South Carolina won them. But you're right, and, and look, Indiana gone. It's, Obama has no chance of carrying it. You're right, of the three historically Republican states, the one that's probably most difficult is Virginia. But I'm, I'm feeling reasonably good about both North Carolina, which is ahead of the trend into, into the Republican column, and Virginia, which I think will be a battle right to the end, but will end up comfortably in the Romney column. And, and then the two are the big two, Florida, Ohio. You know, he's got to win the both, most likely, in order to make this thing work. H how do you feel he's doing? Uh, Ohio, again, looks like the one where it's going to be, it may be the toughest. Yeah, I think Ohio is tougher than Florida. Uh, Florida, though, is uh, was a closer a vote, 2.8 percent. So you'd expect it to move into the Romney column before uh, Ohio, which I think was about a, a three point something or other a victory for Obama last time around. But both of those, here's here's the country as a whole in 2004. Here it is in 2008 and a shift into the Democrat column. But these two states shifted only this much. There was resistance last time around. Obama's got problems with different groups in different states. Florida more likely to end up in the Republican column earlier, but yeah, Ohio is Ohio is going to be a big a big issue in this race. Now, if if he wins, if Romney wins Ohio, all he needs is one other state, a New Hampshire or Pennsylvania or Michigan or Wisconsin or Iowa or Colorado or Nevada or New Mexico, and he wins the election. If he doesn't win it, then he's got to put together either a Pennsylvania or a Michigan and something else, or a Colorado and a Wisconsin and something else, or a couple of other different combinations. But it's easier if you win it, win, win Ohio, win and, Ohio, and then all you got to do is win any other state, no matter how small the number of electoral votes that they have. So, Carl, when the, when the history of this election is written, uh, one of the things that people will focus on is the role of the super PACs, these giant uh, uh, agglomerations of money that aren't under the control of the candidates. You've obviously been one of the prime movers there with American Crossroads. I understand why you do it. I know it's legal, but it's a perversion of the process, isn't it? Well, you know, Alan, I don't remember you saying that about the unions, which reached into their corporate pocketbooks and spent $450 million out of their corporate treasuries in 2008 in order to elect Barack Obama, or in 2004 when they took 
400 million dollars out of their corporate treasuries. They didn't ask their members for permission. They just levied, either levied a, a, a surtax or just simply took it out of the corporate treasuries and spent 400 million dollars to elect John Kerry. That, that's so fine. if I'm, it's a perversion of the system, the unions have been at it for decades. Well, that's and fine. I, so and, there's and, a perversion and I don't, on both I don't sides. remember but the you angst know, in the part of uh, the part of journalists back then. But Carl, you yeah, know, but, but you I, know what? I, I, you I, also know, I think we have been the, talking about this for a long time. I also don't remember people being wired up. No, you haven't. With all due respect, Alan, this has not been. Where was the? Where were the editorials in the New York Times excoriating the NAACP voter fund for announcing it at a fourteen million dollar anonymous contribution in two thousand that they used to run ads saying George W. Bush was a bigot? I, where have I, been, I, the, where have been I, the journalists I, examining the League of Conservation Voters, which has been running, which has been running ads with, from their five hundred one c four attacking congressional Republicans okay, for Carl, decades? But hang on a second. Just hang on a second because I think we have been talking about for quite a long time and 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 the reason we've been talking about it is because people don't like the negativity in politics and the one thing that holds negativity in check is when the candidates have to take responsibility for the advertisements wouldn't we be in a better place if that if those if, if this stuff on both sides uh, wasn't going on well there's a fair point here's the deal I will like strong parties. I wish we had the one part of Bicker that I really think was destructive was limiting the ability of political parties to take large contributions. I would look. Big money is going to find a way to play in politics. You know, and, and, and with all due respect, there's been no serious effort to limit the unions and their spending for as long as it's been around. But, but look, I'd like parties to have the ability to collect big contributions and be stronger, and that would be a better system. But, it, but the system is what the system is, and frankly, it just it, it is it is almost it's almost comical that so many liberal uh, liberal newspapers have begun running these editorials excoriating the conservatives for simply copying what the left has been doing for decades and 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 again you may be right i may have been living in a different alternative universe but i don't remember a single washington post or new york times editorial attacking uh, george soros for raising 150 I, I, million not... dollars in 2004 to go after george w bush and i don't remember a single a single expose on the dark money, the so-called dark money of the labor unions, which they took out of their corporate you, treasury. Do you so think it'll, I'd love do to you, see those stories. Do you think it'll change? Out send them my way. I, I'm, not, I'm not going to take responsibility for the New York Times or the Washington Post, but do you think, do you think it'll change before the next election? The rules. I doubt it. I doubt it. I doubt it. Yeah. And I doubt it because, look, the Democrats have been using 501c4s in the unions for years, and you can't have a system that applies only to conservative groups and not to liberal groups. All right. Well, Carl Rove, thank you very much for spending some time uh, with us. It's going to be interesting to hear uh, Paul Ryan this evening. Appreciate your yeah. thoughts. We're going to take a quick break and uh, be back.